Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Let's talk more about why we're here and, and what's going on. So the COVID trolley, um, I'm going to share my, well, first I'm gonna give you some explanation, then I'm gonna share a presentation. I'm gonna walk through the presentation um, and I'm gonna to try to make this as accessible as possible. So the trolley problem is a frequent um, moral device that is brought up whenever you want to figure out if we pick this path, there's a consequence, and if we pick this path, there's a consequence, and both consequences are pretty terrible. Uh, so which one do you want to suffer with the most, basically? Uh, this is very important today, uh, not just for um, philosophical reasons, but also because of the advent of AI. So because of um, artificial vision, um, machine learning, data science, those things fusing together is creating scenarios where you have self-driving cars, where the car has to make a split decision. Does it go one way and wipe out a 70 year old white elderly woman, or does it go the other way and then wipe out a 17 year old black female? What do you pick? You can only pick one way. You're gonna, you're gonna accidentally tackle someone here uh, at high speed and that's not gonna go well. So what is the criteria you're picking for your choice? Um, I tend to think that that criteria is ultimately going to be um, risk-based economics as they're already calculated in Lloyd's of London and other players. But what's happening now is we're seeing the, the, this moral trolley problem being carted out in the COVID space without formalizing it. So there's this fun little dichotomy that's forming in the mimetic space where it's either, well, the government has to intervene or uh, it's, it's going to kill a lot of people, but the markets have to burn. And other people will say, well, the markets have to stay alive, otherwise the people are going to starve. So in either scenario, you have a really terrible outcome. So what this discussion is going to go down is it's going to say, well, let's back up a bit. Instead of picking one or the other, let's look at this from an epistemological standpoint. And instead of trying to pick one way or another and then rationalize whatever body count you're willing to rationalize, let's instead say, hey, let's explore how these two things feed back into each other. How does the, the population that's getting sick affect the economy and how does the economy improve the people getting sick? So let's look at that feedback loop instead. And so that's, that's a preference. I'm going to now turn over to the screen share and we'll go from there. And I'll go through this one step at a time. Um, and here we go. Let me know if everyone can see that. Okay, a little laser, making sure everyone can see it. So this is the little meme I found floating about the internet. And I realized it's kind of funny. Um, and the, the implication of the meme is that um, you're basically screwed no matter what you pick. You're more along the lines of who do you want to sacrifice first? Do you want to trash the economy? Or do you want to trash a bunch of sick people first? Um, and in either case, they're both getting trashed. So I found this meme to be uh, a proper reflection of the actual problem because of uh, the symbiotic nature. The, the people are the economy and the, the economy feeds back on people. So because of that complicated nature, what is the economy? What, are, what, are, what is COVID even? What are, what are the people? What are, what are all these actors in this play here? Um, I, well, let's, start with, you know, let's start with the train, which is COVID. What is it, right? You might think you know something about it. You might know a little bit about the disease. You might have heard that it's kind of like AIDS and it has this cytokine storm sort of effect. You might have heard a lot of people are getting infected with it, but it accumulates. You've heard a lot. You've heard other people say it's fake. I'm sure you've come across the entire spectrum of possibilities here. Um, so whatever you think you know about it, you actually don't. Uh, unless you were there, and even if you were a lab person sitting there under the microscope, poking and prodding this thing, and you've, or you're one of the team of the potential bioweapon engineers who made this thing, even then you still don't even know what this thing is. And there's a good chance that we'll never know what this thing is. Now, why is that? Th this, these two statements are, are pretty controversial to say because we have a huge amount of faith in the concept of science. The idea that if we put anything under the scrutiny, we'll figure out 
all kinds of details about it and we'll come up with some good enough conclusions. You don't have to figure out, you know, everything down to the particle. We'll figure out what's pragmatic for us and our purposes and our needs. And that's, that's a lot of how we associate the concept of knowing something and then pragmatically extracting usefulness from that knowledge. And that's kind of how we're already trained to go. So when I, pop, when I pop these two statements in front of you and I say, you don't know anything about it and you'll never know what it is. There, there's probably like some of you might be having a, a, a sort of a violent reaction to that to a degree, um, but I'm not here to tempt you and troll you into that type of reaction. What, what I'm saying is that the concept here is knowledge, right? To know something, meaning to have um, a, a definite understanding and capacity of what this thing is. Um, unless anyone here is a, is a virologist, then there's a good chance no one's really going to know anything about it. And that's okay. That is okay. It, usually we're shunned and we're told you can't, you have to know everything because we're smart and we're an advanced civilization. So you have to know everything, but it's okay to not know. It's completely perfect. It, it's, it's perfectly normal. We're humans. There's three pounds of meat up here, right? There, there's more going on in the universe than, than we have the brain capacity for. And that's okay because we have another thing that we do and that's called belief. And belief is, in another, is a very important part of the cognitive process. So whatever you believe about COVID-19, that's what COVID-19 actually is. Again, another controversial statement, because I could believe it's a, a frog, and therefore it is a frog. That's, that's complete insanity. But it's not that far off from what we're already doing. We believe that some of us might believe that it's a, a bioweapon. Some of us might believe that it's a... Uh, someone ate a bat and now the world economy is trash. I mean, there's all kinds of wild stuff. There's a whole spectrum of crazy stuff we're willing to believe here. There might be some truth to that, uh, but truth is, we'll get the truth in a second. Um, but the, the concept of belief, it's, it's not a religious thing. It's not a theocratic thing. Um, it's like uh, belief is how we're making sense of the universe uh, when we have a limited sensory input that we can process at a time. Again, three pounds of meat. You can't store, it's not like a computer up here. It's not a hard drive that stores everything. You're, you're creating models of the universe in your brain. And so you're trying to figure out what is going on about the world with these limited inputs and you use belief to, to make sense of that. And then again, this is okay too, because this is what humans naturally do. And then you'll always believe what COVID is, right? So this is the inverse of never knowing what it is. So whatever you believe COVID is, you're going to continue to believe into the future, even if you're presented with different evidence. It's not that you're going to dig your heels in and say, well, uh, I was presented with some evidence, but I think this, this first conclusion I had was right. You're going to glom onto that. You're going to take what's useful to you and, and append it on your chain as you go. And you're always going to believe that that, that, that original belief that you have is going to mutate over time, but the theme of that original belief will carry through. You're not going to do a hard break. People just don't do hard breaks very often, statistically speaking. They, they kind of evolve over time and over the days. So what we're looking at here is what feels like a juxtaposition between knowing something and believing something, um, but they're not actually juxtaposed at all. They're actually, they intertwine, they interact, and we in the West are not taught about that. We're not taught that these two things interact. Um, we're taught that belief is superstition and knowledge is the only thing that exists. Um, if you approach with that methodology to this problem, you're gonna make too many mistakes. So how do we solve problems? Or, well, not solve, we're not here to solve anything, we're here to explore. So how do we explore problems that we can never know? And when all, the only thing we have is belief. Well, it's not just COVID. It's not just COVID that has this problem. It turns out the global economy, whatever construct you have in your mind about the global economy, same exact problem. You don't know anything about it. You'll never know what the global economy is. It's too, it's too huge. It's distributed. Is it Goldman Sachs? Is it some Rothschild? Is it, the, is it central banks? Is it a bunch of farmers? Is it a, is it a credit swap agreement between two different houses, uh, two different um, uh, banking exchanges? There's a million different parts that's going on here. You'll only ever get a tiny subset of what the global economy is. It's this, it's this massive body of activity in human action. So you'll never really know what the global economy is. Um, but again, you'll certainly have beliefs about it. And you'll always believe what it is based upon what your original beliefs are. Again, how do we explore the problems we can never know?
Now, as I was saying, there's the interplay between truth and belief. This is called epistemology, which is the science of knowledge, right? So um, we, we take the step back. Instead of going down the trolley route and saying, it's going to wipe out the people, but that'll save the economy, or it's going to wipe out the economy, but that'll save the people. Instead, we say, okay, there's a subset of truths about COVID-19 that exist. I don't know them, but I'm willing to accept that they exist. Then we go into beliefs about COVID-19, which I have beliefs about COVID. They might be wrong, but other people have beliefs and they might be wrong, but some of them might be right. I don't know what they are, but I'm willing to accept there's a subset of things that my brain is doing about COVID-19 right now. I'm trying to establish truths about it and I have beliefs about it. And these two things intersect. They're not opposite, they're not enemies. This isn't a, a, a dialectic we're trying to extract from. We're, we're understanding that these two things automatically synthesize, no dialectic required. And from that synthesis, you get knowledge about COVID-19. So you get useful action by, by reconciling the beliefs with the truths. It's not enough to find truths about the COVID-19 situation. Those truths are not going to do anything for you. It's not a question of, oh, it opens the road and now all problems are solved. No, it doesn't solve all the problems because there is an intrinsic relationship between the economy and the people. By influencing one, you influence the other, which has a feedback back to what you've done. So finding a truth isn't enough. You still have to reconcile your beliefs as you try to make sense of this situation. Now, I've been talking in the abstract a lot, so I promise you we're going to get into um, more concrete examples of this kind of high-minded crap that I'm spewing right now. It also turns out that there's another thing that happens when you reconcile truths and beliefs. You, you get poorly justified true beliefs, which is to say you are right about your knowledge. You have pragmatic stuff you can do about it. You just can't defend it very well. That's what that means. So you might have uh, a glimmer of understanding of what's going on, but you, you just don't know how to defend it in either a court of law or in front of a scientist or in front of a lawyer. Um, you, just, you, just, you just know something, right? And this, this kind of struggle leads to two outcomes that are completely, again, these outcomes are completely okay. They work. Um, the first is having knowledge about it where you can explain it, you can defend it, other people see it, they can repeat it, it's good. That leads to more traditional science routes and then the poorly justified true beliefs is what's known as a black box. It works, you just don't know why. And the world is full of black boxes. AI, for the vast majority of AI, is actually a black box. Um, you put an input, it gives you the output. You don't know why it worked, it just did. Um, and that's, that's okay. These are, this is all okay. None of this is a stigma. <laughs> There's a huge cultural stigma around this sort of stuff. Um, so epistemology, we're gonna lay out on the, on the bottom what faded into view was this gradient where we have localized belief of going from, going from left to right, defined truths, communal truths, localized truths, adjustable processes or pragmatic black boxes, defined beliefs, communal beliefs, local beliefs. So um, local beliefs are things that you, and local truths are things that you have experienced. Communal beliefs and truths are things that many of us have experienced and defined beliefs are things, and defined beliefs and defined truths are things that exist independent of both. All of this leads to a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic black box or an adjustable process. I'm getting ahead. I'm going to walk you through all this stuff. I promise it's going to make sense. If this is over anyone's head, if I'm going too fast, uh, I, will, I, will, I will make this all work, I promise. So here's some examples, finally some examples, right? Out of this high-minded crap I'm spewing. So a localized belief would be COVID-19 appears scary. That's a pretty common local belief. I, I certainly have that local belief. Um, communal beliefs is something that we all tend to agree on. Uh, we need to self-isolate. Whether we do it or not, it's a different story, but we need to. Um, that's a belief. And then the defined belief is that COVID-19 exists. It's there. It's in the world. Right? So these are beliefs. They feel like truths. They certainly feel like truths, but they're beliefs. Now, what's the distinction? Well, let me give you some examples and truths. A localized truth is that many of us do not know many people with it. That's a true statement. COVID-19 is scaring people. That is a true statement as well. 
it's not that it, it appears scary. It, it is doing it, right? And that it's definitively doing this. This is repeatedly, you take a snippet of the world and you get, hey, this is scaring people. Okay, it's scaring people. Um, defined truth would be that we can demonstrate that COVID-19 has hurt the stock exchanges. 30% uh, wipe of the market just in the past like month. It's been disaster. So what do we do with these points, right? Well, excuse me one moment. I believe I have to sneeze. Uh, nope, I don't have to. Okay. Therefore, there wasn't a truth of it. So um, we have our... We have our beliefs and our truths, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to find either black boxes or adjustable processes. We don't know what they are right now, so we're going to walk through and explore and figure out what the hell these are. And so, yeah, we're, we're trying to squeeze these things together to reconcile, uh, to find out what we can actually do about it instead of either listening to an authority or listening to some conspiracy or listening to our friends. What can we actually tangibly do about this stuff to understand? the cycle between the people, the economy, and, and all the interrelation. So because of this, uh, those little, those little uh, boxes I showed you in the bottom, that's, that's a categorization process. We're trying to categorize what's a belief and what is knowledge, uh, what is truth so that we can find knowledge here. Um, so this is an epi um, epistemic categorization. Uh, and what is the epistemic categorization of this virus? Well, it's, it's a nightmare, unfortunately. Now, why is it a nightmare? Nightmare Be because of how it's all combined. This is a lot. I'm going to walk you through this, right? So, hey, Pat. Um, yeah. So there's this giant uh, gray box in the middle of the screen. Uh, other people noticed it. Yeah, your your mouse is on it right now. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Thanks, folks. Um, so we have. Let's just start with some high level categorization, so we can wrap our head around this problem. We have infected, and we have uninfected. I think that's a fair categorization to start with. It might be too coarse. Uh, but it's where we start because we're exploring. We're not trying to solve, we're exploring, right? So put on your door the explorer hat and away we go. Um, infected people can be further categorized into these people are infected and they know it. They're infected and they don't know it. They're infected and they believe they have it. They're infected and they don't believe they have it. Now, the last of the two here that you can see that I'm circling of these two, they can be broken down further into people who are infected, they don't know it, and they know they can get it. People are infected, they don't know it, and they don't know they can get it. People are infected, you see how it combines, right? It just kind of explodes from there, right? So each one of these is a category that you have to account for when you're trying to figure out what is true and what is a belief. This is very important in the belief analysis part because this indicates the type of range of actions that a person's willing to take based upon these categorization motives effectively or state of being. Um, the infected person, they don't believe they have it, they are infected, and they don't believe they will get it. That's, that's a totally different spectrum of action that person will take as opposed to a person who's uninfected and they know it. It'll totally influence their actions. Now going to the uninfected side, um, same rules apply. There's a lot of combinations of these different types of categories. Now, uh, excuse me one moment. I got to get my little, so as you can tell, it's, uh, it gets messy real quick when you start combining all these things together. And so if anybody tries to say, well, I have the truth of something, well, first you have to, you have to, you have to resolve this combination of, of, of interactions because each one of these people are interacting with each other. That is what infection is. That is what the economy is. It's human action interacting with one another. So how do all of these types of people interact? Mm, that's, that's a tough one. That's a huge amount of data you have to gather. So we tend to rely on heuristics. We tend to rely on belief to help us navigate this mess. And again, that's okay. There is no stigma to belief because it's a starting point to make sense of all this stuff. Um, now, again, there are people who tend to come up and they like to say, oh no, it's the blue church ball with loud opinions. And they'll say, oh, because of this messy combination of stuff, it's ripe for trolling. It's ripe for uh, propaganda and disbelief and, and all the negative things. And that is true. That's a true statement. But that's legit, right? So let's explore precisely how to do disinformation campaign given this combination of information. So here is a, I made all these numbers up. None of these are true. They're just demonstrations. So what I've done is I've taken the, an 
uninfected group here. I've broken them down into no believe, don't know, don't believe, and then further can get, can't get, so forth, right? And I've done the same for the infected. And these percentages, again, they're made up, they're garbage, but they're demonstrating a point. They're demonstrating the chances of, of this group of people intersecting with this group of people and then coordinating in a way that can help them for their local problems. I'm just, because there's, there's way more different combinations of factors you're looking at here. I didn't even represent uh, infected interacting with infected or uninfected interacting with uninfected. This is purely just like a small subset of, of how crazy you want to play this game of, of, um, of seeing what these categorization, what, how these categories interact with each other in a way that's beneficial to each. Um, and as you can tell, it's just ludicrous. Uh, the, these, this is just nuts. Um, and this is a failure of, of categorization theory to a degree, which is in, in a sense, a failure of set theory, which in turn could be a failure of the scientific approach, which we will get to. Um, so if there is a fear here, if there's a genuine fear that there's some disinformation campaign, um, I would like for you to point to me what cell do you target to get the maximum amount of disinformation? That's really hard because there's too much craziness going on. There's too much interaction going on here. It's not like a, a central conspiracy where I can come down and say, oh, if I touch this cell, it'll spread to all these other cells. Now, structurally, yes, there are center points that you can target to maximize the influence of these statistics. You could say target the uh, central media. You could say target central banking and influence all of these variables at once. That's absolutely true. That's a bias and a weighting uh, approach. Um, but if I was just a 4chan troll, I'd say, well, I'm going to try this number. I'm going to hack this by 5%. And I'm going to put some disbelief here. And I'm going to bring it down by 5% so their ability to local coordinate will go down. And so therefore, ha, I'm the master troll. I don't know. I have no idea what kind of effect that's going to have on the rest of these numbers. Uh, it's, it's too small of an operation. So if, if trolls are your biggest concern, if disinformation from individual actors, uh, uh, bad faith actors is your primary concern, um, you're giving them too much power because for starters, if they're able to touch one of these cells and influence all the other cells, it sounds like they should be in charge of the COVID-19 response more than uh, not be allowed to be anywhere near it. Because if, if they can predict their interactions with these, with these points, then these guys are really good and you should probably tap them for their brain power instead of being afraid of them. Of course, Blue Church Ball has his meltdown, but that's Blue Church Ball, right? So this, this, is, the, this is the combination of, of how complicated it can get really quickly when you're trying to figure out um, uh, epistemic categories and approaches. So let's back off the hard science approach because it's just outright impossible. It's pointless. It's almost premature to a degree. Let's instead try to explore proxies of truth. Again, we're not solving the problem of the economy and the virus. What we're doing is we're trying to explore the interactions between our beliefs and the truths we can discover to find bro to proxies of truth. We're not finding solutions. We're finding proxies of truth. A proxy of truth is, is sort of like a foothold where you can then expand your options to do further exploration, right? So if I was to start with localized beliefs, the three examples I gave when I started, COVID-19 appears scary. This will then open up things I need to resolve and what proxies of truth can I find that are local to me? Um, how can I solve the things I'm afraid of? If COVID-19 appears scary, then I'm scared of something and I need to figure out what it is I'm actually scared about. Right? So that's, that's a truth exploration process I should go through. I should find proxies to understand what I'm actually afraid of and then identify that. Uh, if I can't do that for whatever reason, uh, maybe I'm like extremely extroverted and I have no experience with introversion and, and self-exploration. Again, that's fine. Not everyone's the same. You should start looking at other people then. So if, you, if you're extrovert oriented, you should probably be looking at what other people are afraid of and what solutions they're finding to, to manage that, that fear. Could be self-isolation, alcoholism, uh, that's a thing, right? There's a whole medley of solutions. You start looking and, and seeing how they're interacting with one another. So depending upon what your preferences are, there are ways to get to the heart of what actually appears scary about this. Um, when you do that, you will come to a defined truth that is defined to you. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, some stuff's happening. Um, that I have some solutions of what I'm afraid of, right? So now you have some truths 
to figure out this belief. You're not trying to eliminate the belief. This isn't the scientific method I'm promoting. I'm not saying eliminate the belief. I'm saying evolve the belief into these proxies of truth. And that is important because there's one more step after this. So let's move on. We need to self-isolate to communal beliefs. Here's the example. Self-isolation interferes with my routines. That's called being self-honest. Maybe we have st maybe we have stuff to do. Maybe I have to go shop or buy food. You know, this is this is a significant impact on my ability to to stay, you know, not infected while simultaneously staying alive. Um, so this is a truth about the belief. The belief is we need to self-isolate. The truth is it's kind of hard. We got stuff to do. Um, and self-isolation isn't even widely embraced. So there are other nations that are not engaging in the self-isolation paranoia that we're doing right now. So you take, uh, I think, Japan, but they're iffy on their numbers um, from what I've seen. But I think Norway was pretty aggressive about not self-isolating at all. Um, and then there's other states in America that aren't engaging in self-isolation. Now there's shame tactics and all these things that happen and, you know, trying to yell at each other to, you know, stay indoors. Um, but for the most part, we have a, we have a diaspora of self-isolation uh, um, adhesion or, or, or usage or, um, you know what I mean? Um, so, okay. So now we have self-isolation we need to, but the, the truths of it is that we're not really actually doing it. Um, it's, it's not a solution. That's, that's a defined truth. Self-isolation by itself is not a solution because you have too many people engaging in whatever they think self-isolation is. They have their belief of what self-isolation means, and so that's informing their, their proxy of truth. And it's not going to be the same for all of us. So because of that, self-isolation simply isn't a solution by itself um, it, it, because we're dealing with an infectious agent. Um, so now we have... Uh, COVID-19 exists as our defined belief. Um, I don't have close relations with many COVID-19 patients. That, I'm speaking from my localized truth position. That's probably true for a lot of us as well, although I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, and if you are dealing with COVID-19, my absolute regards in this situation. From what I've read about it, it is rather frightening when it really kicks off. Um, but I do know communally that, uh, that there are reports of people with it. So there are certainly some people with it. Uh, even though I don't know anybody who who has it, or I don't have close relations with many people who have it, right? Um, so I'm left with a defined truth that some people have COVID-19 and others don't have it. Now, all this seems kind of elementary that I'm walking through, and maybe I'm giving too much emphasis on my own performance on explaining it. Um, but this is all pretty basic conclusions we may have sort of reached on our own. But again, this is a transitory step. There is a final step after this. So I'll give you some more. We're going to click through. Um, I'm certainly not showing any COVID-19 symptoms, but I'm coughing from time to time, but that's about it. Um, so I don't, so if I'm not showing symptoms, but let's look at a truth, I don't have access to reliable testing. Man, that's a localized truth. I can't just go to the doctor and be like, yo, do I got COVID? And be like, you know, yes, no, it's just not an option. I don't have that. Um, nations are not providing the same testing coverage when we expand to the communal. Uh, they're not providing the same coverage at all. Uh, they don't have enough tests. Uh, some nations are militant about it. Other nations are not. Um, we're left with the defined truth that there isn't widespread access to COVID-19 testing. Uh, then the, the illustrious, hilarious bat soup problem, um, where communally some guy ate a bat soup and then the, uh, the stock market lost 30%. Uh, I've never eaten a bat, so that's a localized truth. I am 100% confident that I've never eaten a bat. Um, although... Someone may have snuck it into my canned food once. You never know. <laughs> um, but I do know that bats migrate. They are a migratory species. Uh, some of them do fly as great distances as birds do. That's a known thing. Um, so what this does, now we're getting to an interesting proxy of truth. The first three that I, the first four kind of throw away. They're just like demonstrating what I'm talking about here. Now we're, because we're engaging in this proxy of truth process, now we've come up with something interesting. We've come up with an interesting proxy. The bat migration should have an influence on CODIV, because I can't spell, COVID-19 spread. It should, because if these things are terrible carriers, then, well, it, bat migrations and COVID infections should be simultaneous, should be one-to-one, -one, right? So now we found a proxy of truth that we can stand on and say, now, wait a minute, this is missing from my belief system. I did not have this previously. Ah, okay. 
interesting. So we're taking our beliefs, we're exploring them not to cancel the belief, we're not Western scientific method. We're saying, I, this was not part of my belief system before, now I have to reconcile this. Interesting, okay. So then COVID-19 started in China. That's a very common, I think that's a defined belief at this point. Um, I don't know much about Chinese public health policies, me personally. Maybe there's a Chinese public health policy expert in the audience right now, but I'm certainly not that person. So that's my localized truth. Communal truth is that other pandemics did start in China. Right? They have SARS and all types of animal human viruses that jumped. Um, I just here, please move this window away. Whatever. Um, uh, other pandemics have started in China. There's a long history of that. Um, and so China does have ways, uh, so from these two truths, we can then derive that China has ways to assess where to apply public health policies. So they are, they do have metrics. They are using, uh, if we assume China has X number of resources um, and Y number of people. So how do we apply, how do we distribute, how do, I'm sorry, not we, how does China distribute the X resources to the Y people and then it's not a utilitarian distribution. It's not like they're going for the widest amount of people they can go for. They're going for specific people. They're giving resources to the specific people that they particularly want to save. And we can identify, as best we can at least, um, uh, we, can, we can attempt to identify who it is they're willing to save and who it is they're willing to sacrifice. So this gives us useful information about their public health policy, which can then inform how other nations might be either following it or what they're doing differently. Uh, and then a couple more, and, and then we'll move on to the final piece. Uh, hospitals are a place that can help. Uh, I've seen hospitals request more supplies. So I, I, this is my local truth because I've, I'm actually dealing with some of the acquisition of supplies for some of these hospitals. Um, uh, and the communal truth is that, well, the, the media is, is showing Italian hospitals as New York hospitals. There's that one little flub they did a couple of days ago that made the rounds, and that's... Uh, what are you doing guys right uh, on one hand they might be doing that to convey the point that this is scary and you should do the self-isolating like we're saying it or they could be just a bunch of jerk offs being dicks with cameras uh, or they could be both simultaneously it's not necessarily mutually exclusive um hospitals what we're able what we're able at least from my local truth perspective um i know that hospitals are requesting more supplies I know that there are media reports showing the wrong hospitals on purpose. I know that in addition to the media on social media, uh, people are sharing videos and attributing them to hospitals where those videos did not come from. So it's obvious that these hospitals do not have any control over what is said about them on social media and even what is said about them on legacy media. Uh, what this means to me is that hospitals are not prepared to handle this. They're just simply not. Um, the, the, the supplies that they're getting uh, and the media, the lack of media control on their front means that any type of scare can panic people into a hospital unnecessarily, which says to me that they're not prepared for it. So this, this, type, of, um, this type of fear can influence the resource acquisition from the hospitals. Uh, one hospital might get more supplies that they shouldn't, the other one will get less supplies. Um, and this player right here is not helping things at all. Um, so this belief is that hospitals can help, but because of the problem here, they might not be places that can help. And that's, that's unfortunate because that's a really deeply held local belief for many, many people. Um, there will be a cure eventually. Yeah, okay, that's that's a hopeful belief. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be the, the, the black pill negative Nancy on this one, but... Um, Let's look at a uh, localized truth. We saw President Trump say uh, hydroxychloroquine works. And then, of course, in Arizona, a couple decided to take the fish cleaner, which is not hydroxychloroquine, but whatever. Um, I've seen President Trump say that. I don't know if it works, but I've seen him say that. Um, there are at least six distinct COVID-19 vaccine trials initiatives going on right now from different countries. Um, so as a result, we have a anti-malarial chemical solution and we have an attenuated, back, uh, an attenuated viral um, vaccine solution. Now, the challenge here is that you can only take one or the other from a market share perspective. If I'm manufacturing a million pills of, of hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine and I'm putting in the tremendous uh, money for 
vaccine trials, FDA approvals, everything else. I'm looking at a sick person as a unit of market that I then have to then put this into, right? So if I give you a vaccine, there's a chance you're not going to take the, the anti-malarial. And if I give you the anti-malarial and it works, there's a chance you're probably not getting the vaccine, although you might, right? So there is a market pressure here. This is an interesting thing that's not being discussed. It's being alluded to. So this is another one of those interesting proxies of truth. Hey, now, wait a second. Uh, these two might have competitive pressures with one another. That's interesting, right? So now your, your belief space is now expanded and you have to then reconcile. And then finally, uh, COVID-19 is causing mass unemployment. Uh, I'm currently working home because of contagion fears, which sucks, but I am. Um, and there's a lot of people who are just at home and not working, which sucks even more. Um, but I do know communally that 6 million people applied for unemployment, I think is at 10 million now, uh, but I don't know if those numbers are true. Um, but I know at least six. Uh, that's astronomical. That's the, that is absolutely, that's like beyond Great Depression levels. Um, and so, again, the dreaded code of 19, uh, we know that it is damaging the economy. So from this belief, it, the belief is that it's causing mass employment. Turns out it probably is, right? So this is, this is damaging the economy. So th what we've done is we've explored beliefs and we turned them into proxies of truths. We're not solving it, we're exploring. We're trying to figure out our belief space more than anything else. Okay, so why am I harping on about belief and knowledge and all this stuff, right? This seems so freaking elementary and fundamental. And here's why. Here's why I've spent so much time on this. This is the process we've been going through. Traditionally, in the West at least, this is how we go about our process. We take our belief, Take our belief and we say, oh, we found proxies of truth and then we will find the grand unquestionable of the thing, right? We'll find this one truth, this one axiom that's so pure and so, so absolutely binding. Um, and then we can dismiss the process that we use to get there and we can dismiss the belief entirely. We can compact all of it into this grand unquestionable of the thing and then poof, we have it, right? This is, this is, the, this is the Western scientific tradition. Is the, or specifically the materialist scientific tradition where we, it's, a, it's a flow, it's a pipe flow where you start here, you follow the line and you get to the great truth. And then you have your science, your big science that they always say on Reddit, right? Um, this is absolutely not going to help for the reasons that we've already explored. So this is useless, right? This does not help us at all in the current solution because of the feedback mechanism between the economy and the people. Just because you found the unquestionable thing for the economy does not mean you found the unquestionable thing for the people. So, oops, you found your grand unquestionable thing, but it's, it's great in isolation. It has no pragmatic value whatsoever. So what do you actually have to do? You have to reconcile. You have to reconcile your beliefs with your proxies of truth to find a process. And in this case, we know that COVID-19 starts in China. We have, our, we have our proxies of truth. And then we say, oh, the reconciliation is we need a process to explore what metrics China is using to guide pandemic response. This is a rational thing you should be considering because you can't get to here if you use the materialistic scientific tradition because the materialistic scientific tradition is too busy trying to find these silver bullets. It's trying to find these one-shot kills that, that unify all of these systems and unify all these responses. That's not going to work because the, 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 the challenge space is too complicated. You have too many variants in the virus. You have too much variance in the global economy. So you have to build these little ladder, step ladder, like steps to get to these processes. And that will give you a much better way of solving uh, these complicated problems. So just to familiar with this, when we resolve that, we say a process to examine fear, to to identify primary motivations. That's an important process to have when we are tackling this particular problem. Because if you don't even, if you don't have a process for that, man, if you're fear driven, then the rest of this stuff isn't even gonna work. Process to evaluate motives of nodes and interconnected networks. Again, self-isolation, we now know that these people interact, their nodes in the network, and, and what are their actual motives? How effective will the self-isolation actually be? COVID-19 exists. I you know, some people have it, others don't. We need to explore why countries have different infection rates. Why, why is one country hit harder than the other? Why is Italy so devastated? Is it all media? Is it not media? Is, you know, you have to look at these differentials because that's going to give you understanding of things that, you, that you're not going to get elsewise. Otherwise, you'll just, you'll just be exposed to like, oh, and now Zimbabwe got hit and you'll be like, oh my God, Zimbabwe, that's so bad. 
Uh, and then like a week later, be like, oh, then then Zaire got hit. Oh my God, Zaire! And you'd be panicking all the time. It's not going to do you any good. Um, so you have to explore. You know, look at the differentials. What was effective? What wasn't? Uh, explore why testing is so difficult. Why is it so hard to test? Right. This will force you to look into the actual uh, biomechanics of the virus, which is admittedly complicated because it's virology and it always is. Uh, but it's something you should know anyway when you're trying to tackle this problem. You you need to know as you need to have a process to extract useful pragmatic knowledge or at least black boxes from this thing. Excuse me. Uh, did it come from bat soup? Then let's look at how bat carriers work and we can immediately dismiss that uh, if we look at the migration and, and transmission rates. So that's just not it, right? And we only get to that conclusion because we've found the process to examine that, hey, bat migration should have, a, should have an influence. So it starts in China, then we explore what metrics China is using to guide pandemics. We've walked through that, a process to identify which hospitals are prepared and which ones are not. That's really important too. That's like a variation of, of uh, this problem, uh, or at least this process. You might be able to steal some of the techniques you, get, you use here to then apply here to figure out um, the preparation scale. Uh, obviously New York and Los Angeles, but other players as well. Um, trying to find economic pressures of a cure. That is a very fascinating part of this problem um, because that is going to have an influence on a lot of these other things leading up to it um, because everybody wants a cure now. They, they're all afraid. They, they've, they still, we're all self, we're trying to be self-isolated, I should say. Um, but the, the economic pressures for the cure matter on the run up to the cure, not after the cure has already been given. So there's definitely going to be pressures associated there. You want to find boards, you want to find people, what are they actually doing? Um, and then finally, uh, you want to examine how the economy is anticipating the future. So when you combine all of these, when you figure out all of these processes, you'll then be able to deal with this one, which is what this talk is ultimately about. How do you, how is the economy anticipating the future? The economy doesn't exist in a, in a current state. It doesn't say, oh, I traded this apple for this banana and, and that's the end of the transaction forever. No, we keep a receipt, we keep a list, we analyze those lists, we analyze the transactions, we then make projections into the future about where things are going. Like for example, you have all these hospitals that are ordering thousands of beds that they didn't have previously. What are they going to do with these beds when this is over? It's not like they can keep them in their facility. It'll block up all their space. What are they gonna do with it? Well, there has to be some company out there who's going to take that response. I'll, be, oh, I'll take that. I'll take those surplus beds and I'll allocate them somewhere else. So there's already an agent in this network who is anticipating moving those beds out to a profitable location after this whole thing is over. And they're already setting timelines. And, oh, they have the profit motive to care about this sort of stuff. So all you have to do is find these people. And now you can start getting and building a complete picture about how these things are interfluing and influencing one another. So instead of relying on news and relying on uh, whatever localized uh, sources of truth you can extract and using that as your foundation of operation, if you search for these processes, you're going to expand both your truth space and your belief space simultaneously, and you're going to get more comfortable reconciling them. So finally, to wrap this all up, because I, I know this is a lot and I think I'm, I don't know what my time is. I apologize, Peter. Um, so this is the COVID trolley. Why are we picking epi uh, epistemic reconciliation over materialist scientific tradition? Because three factors, the story never ends, agents adapt, and once, the, once struck the golf balls on its own. The story never ends means right here, once that COVID hits, it's not going to you know, do that and then leave. COVID's going to do this over and over and over again. And it's going to influence each other. And as it does so, these players are going to respond as the COVID is doing this. For example, not being talked about, but October, there's going to be a second round of this. Yeah, there's going to be a second round of COVID as it mutates, and more people are going to get hit with it. So how are the people in the economy going to adapt as they go around with this, right? It's going to go round and round. And finally, once struck, the golf ball is on its own. Once COVID is in this cycle, it's going to do whatever the hell it wants. We're going to do our best to steer it, of course, hopefully using epistemic reconciliation, uh, but more likely we're unfortunately going to use this. Um, but this thing is on its own. It is on a crash course and mapping it is going to be tough. But if you find the processes to then examine this, you can actually get to how these two are interacting and find out how this is interacting with these. And poor government sitting here with almost nothing it can do about anything. Uh, there's 
the, throughout most of history, pandemics, governments, they, they just throw their hands up and they say, they doom entire cities and say, sorry, pal, that's it. Um, uh, the idea of this interventionist government coming in and paying your bills and not making rent happen, uh, again, you, the same rules apply. The story never ends. Let's say people don't pay rent. What does that do to the economy? Okay, well, now <laughs> you're not collecting rent, which means um, – which means uh, mortgage futures are probably going to have problems. And so that can cascade into even more economic uh, effects, which can now displace these people and make them homeless. And if they're homeless, what do you think the spread of virus is when they're all homeless in these camps together? Guess what? We just accidentally made the problem worse. So these are the type of things you have to really, really look at. You don't have to look at it carefully, right? We're not under... I mean, we're under a gun, this thing right here, um, but you still have the freedom to explore the interaction of your proposals, the interaction of how these players interact. Um, uh, that's a, that was a tautology, I apologize. But you'll be able to understand, you'll be able to have processes to understand how these players are influencing one another. Because once that golf ball is on its way, it's not leaving. Um, and that's it. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk. I'll take questions. <laughs> awesome. Um, cool. So, Pat, can you unshare your, your screen? Yes. Let me do that, I think. So, um, while Pat does that, this is, I think, this is what we'll do. Uh, are you okay to stay maybe 15, 30 minutes after? Or like, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, if anyone has to leave, they can, they can leave anytime they want. Um, so, we'll open it up to questions. Um, and we'll, we'll probably end uh, at eight o'clock Eastern time or sooner. Um, so if you have any questions for Pat, write in the chat box, I'll call on you to unmute yourself, or if you want me to read on your path, just indicate that and I'll uh, warm Pat up with a question. Um, so you mentioned uh, uh, the blue church ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think our buddy uh, Jordan Hall coined that. Um, so I'm curious, uh, how do you think, maybe you can uh, first, just uh, describe what you think blue church means uh, for the people who don't know. And how do you think the blue church is currently responding to the situation um, or how they will uh, respond to it uh, in the future, or maybe just how they're fucking up uh, in their response. Yeah. Um, blue church is, is the conquerors of the scientific methodology. That's how I tend to define them. So these are the people, the blue church finds its origin in the 1600s um, during, after the 30 years war when the papacy and um, other Protestant actors decided, hey, it would be hilarious if we wipe each other out in a 30 year war, that sounds fun. Um, and meanwhile, the, the, that was the origin of the blue church was the idea that we need to back away from this unholy union of the papacy with Kings and just stop that please. And let the economies as they are flow on their own. Um, and so the blue church today is the apex evolution of that incentive and of that drive. These are players who have done fantastic work with taking rationalization and scientific methodology and really taking it to its ends, to its furthest ends possible within the constraints of whatever economic system or whatever natural system we're dealing with. I, I, these are not stupid people by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but they have used this trick of science extensively, and it is the only trick they know. They don't know any other methodology. And so they've blinded themselves to the other half of human cognition, which is belief. Belief is a very important part of human cognition. And these guys make all of their profit by basically stamping it out of existence. Um, and I don't mean belief in concepts of, of God or anything like that. I, I mean the, the cognitive biomechanical processes of belief. They just pretend they don't exist. Or if they do exist, it's either a conspiracy theory or it's something that has to be uh, regulated out of existence or it's not scientific or it doesn't pass muster. You know, they have infinite gatekeepers for this sort of thing. Um, but that's what power does. Power is gatekeeping. And they have been successful uh, from the 1600s on. They made the right gamble. They put in the work. They put in the body count. They put in the blood. So they were able to build this empire of science very, very well. Um, and right now, with the advent of AI and the advent of neurochimera and all of these radical philosophy of mind discoveries that have happened in the past 30 years, at least, with, with the, as a byproduct of the, of the computer age, 
um, the blue church is under definitive attack at the foundation level. And they have no idea how to even examine themselves. Their scientific method is, is for their enemies. It's not for themselves. <laughs> they apply science to their enemies. Um, so that inability to engage in the necessary introspectrum, I think, uh, is uh, the inability to apply science to your own failure is the hallmark of blue church decadence, in my opinion. Cool. Cool. Um, so Daniel, you have a question. Could you unmute yourself and ask it to Pat? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for that talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if you, this is kind of an ill-formed question, but if you had to speculate on the source of this app apparent fragility, like it's just so clear that everything is fragile, where would you place it? What, what are like the top candidates that come to mind? There's one, there's just one source of fragility. It's, it's blank slate. Blank slate is the source of all fragility of this system. If you eliminate blank slate, which we will be able to do very soon, uh, the, the blue church is gone. Um, it is it is the foundation of everything they do. And what is blank slate, right? Um, it, it's it's the uh, it's the John it's the Lockean concept. Lockean, uh, John Locke made it popular, but he didn't necessarily invent it. Um, blank slate is the idea that every human is born with nothing. The idea that we can we are what we are the sum of our experiences. Uh, that's that's what blank slate tries to say. Um, well, that's that's not the full picture. Uh, we're also the sum of four billion years of evolution. So yeah, you, you can't just say like, oh, it's uh, the this mythical three pound bag of meat called the brain. Whatever I chisel in that, that's who you are. Uh, no, that's that's not who we are. That's one part of who we are. Uh, we're also four billion years of winner take all evolution. We're also predator prey. Uh, we're also uh, scanning reality, not at the atomic level. We have the ability to see each atom because the way photons work, the photon bounces off the atom. I'm sorry, not bounces. Photon gets absorbed by the atom. Photon then rejects an atom. So every photon in this universe comes from an atom, and yet we don't see atoms. We see weird emerging thing. Our, our, our entire visual cortex has evolved to see each other, not atoms. We're seeing each other for mating reasons, social reasons, coordination reasons. So this is, a, this is not something that was chiseled into my brain because some propaganda minister put it in there. That's four billion years of evolution. And you can't just throw that out the window because it's inconvenient. You can't say, well, we're all equal and that's it. That's it. And if you disagree, I'm going to use my massive force to clobber you in the face. It's, it's, you can't do that. <laughs> we, we are social creatures first. We are the byproduct of neural evolution, and these things are messy, and these things suck. These are very dangerous games that we're standing on top of. Um, so I would say the blank slate theory has done its best to eliminate those games from our cognition and try to say, well, you don't have to worry about that anymore um, because power is consolidated in academia or its power is consolidated in some kingdom and that person is dictating reality and that person dictates that you are a blank slate, you are a replaceable cog, so therefore fuck off and go learn something to improve yourself. And I think if you hammer uh, blank slate for exactly what it is, you will dismantle the blue church entirely. As a really quick follow-up to that, um, I'm sure you've noticed that uh, behavioral economics is kind of in vogue these days, also in <laughs> positions of governance. And it at least gives lip service to what you're talking about, that it acknowledges our bounded rationality and that we have biological predispositions that don't necessarily give us accurate perspectives of reality. What would you say um, is the reason why that's insufficient? Because it's uh, still tr it's still pegged to the concept of reality. It's still pegged that there is a scientific concept of reality. Uh, start, there is a scientific concept of reality. It's science conceives of it, so therefore it is a concept of reality. Um, but it does not have a monopoly on reality. And so trying to appeal to that reality is sort of a transitory step. Um, but it is not the only one. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so Marshall had a, a question that's related to the Blue Church. I'll read it on his behalf. Um, Pat, what, in your opinion, are the most useful abstractions or practices that can be gleaned from the Blue Church and scientific materialism? Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I do agree. Uh, the Blue Church did accidentally stumble on philosophy of mind. That is true. Um, but you can backtrack 
that technically all the way back to Plato. The one thing that, that ah, God, I, I hate, sometimes I just hate philosophical autists because they just get so lost in the weeds and they just don't step back and take things in the, in the anachronism in which it was born. So there's one statement that, that Plato has said and said, storytellers rule the world. He didn't say logical people rule the world. He, he didn't say computer scientists or engineers rule the world. He said storytellers rule the world. Now we've been on this 2000 year and, and for what it's worth, the post, um, the postmodernists do have a okay point regarding this. We've been on this 2000 year tear trying to reproduce the works of Aristotle and Plato, uh, until, Plato until we're bored in the face with it all. Um, but we just kind of missed that footnote as storytellers rule the world. That's a really important footnote to miss if we're interested in actually uh, uh, trying to represent the world as it currently is. So I think it's worthwhile to backtrack and reevaluate Plato, not as, as some type of philosopher who is trying to create this very weird version of society according to whatever efficiencies he deemed a higher priority. Um, he came up, uh, I mean, gee, the work he put into play, I mean, we're, almost everything's a footnote of Plato if you really get down to it. Um, understanding the power of stories means giving credence to belief. And if we're not willing to give credence to belief, um, as the Blue Church deems that we shouldn't ever do, uh, then that's the part of the bathwater you need to throw out. I don't, I don't think the patient is inoperable. I think there are, you can cherry pick parts that are good and parts that are bad. Um, there are certain discussions to be had about what parts are decent. Like for example, uh, the, I'm a programmer by trade, 20 years doing it, way too long. Uh, commercial internet web technologies primarily. Uh, I've, I've watched the internet become what it's become. It's a disaster. This is not the internet that we've tried to build. Um, this is the what corporate internet would look like if, if they had a shot at it. But I suspect in, in a couple of years, the only social media platform that'll be left is LinkedIn, or at least everything will look like LinkedIn. A very boring, sterile, everybody's showing their perfect face social credit system. Um, that's not the internet I wanted. That's not the internet I built. I, I, I wanted weirdo shit posting all over the place. That's what I want. Uh, because I like the full spectrum of, of human belief. I'm not afraid of human belief. I like it as it is, even if it believes in the weird stuff. I think if Blue Church gets its head out of its ass long enough to say, hey, uh, we don't need dominance of the narrative. It's okay to let people express themselves. And great. Um, but if they're not willing to do that, unfortunately, now we have to talk the power game, which means we may accidentally end up taking away from the blue church what's actually good for the rest of us, just as part of the power negotiation. And that sucks, but that's a reality I'm fully prepared for. I might be alone or in the, in the minority on that. So, so uh, uh, there's another question that uh, I'm going to piggyback off it, and this is from Joe. I'm going to read on his behalf. Um, what are the most promising analytical processes you've been seeing developed outside of the institutions by the ecosystem of collective sense makers? Mm, IARPA comes to mind, technically part of the institution, but they are fascinating. Uh, the super forecaster research has been unbelievable. Um, they are, th this is a black box, right? So this is, this is where science starts to have problems in, in, in these black box spaces. There are people who can predict the future. I'm going to use some dumb parlance right now, and I'll, I'll explain what that means. But there are people that can predict the future repeatedly. It is repeatedly proven that people can predict some parts of the future. We don't have any idea how it's actually done, but it is repeatedly provable. And to demonstrate the repeatability of it, when you put people in a group, they predict the future better than people who operate alone. This is repeatably provable over and over and over again. Now, how the hell does that even comport to scientific methodology? What are you going to do? You're going to cut up the brain and be like, well, this neuron was doing this and this. No, that's not what's going on. The, these bringing more minds together allows them to sense make collectively, um, but not synchronistically. So that sense making and in, in the sense where they're eliminating all beliefs and they're coming up like, brain ants where everyone thinks the same and so they can amplify their position they're holding on to their individuality and they're collectively navigating each other's individuality 
and that in turn is improving their ability to predict the future. This, the, a variance of this is called knockout training in AI, which I was describing yesterday to you, Peter, um, where if I give you a book and I rip out a page and I rip out every other page, so I rip out all the, even, well, it's a book, so you have like, you know what I mean, but I'm just, a PDF, like I give you a PDF file and I knock out all the, uh, the, uh, the even pages, right? So you have pages one, three, uh, five, and if I can count, right? So if you were to read this PDF, you'd read page one, you get the page three and you'd read it. Now, there's a really good chance you'd be able to figure out what you missed, right? If page one was talking about uh, Samuel and Samuel was the hero and then page three, everybody's celebrating the funeral of Samuel, you could probably allude to the fact that on page two, he probably died, right? You could piece that together to some capacity. Um, that is important in AI training as well when you have a training set. So if, if I'm trying to train an AI to see apples or oranges, um, I can either feed it 4,000 pictures of apples so it can get an understanding of what an apple is. But if I knock out, if I randomly knock out pictures of that training set, if I randomly say, no, you're not going to get this apple. You're not going to get this one. You're not going to get this one. It actually improves the AI's performance by 50%. So it can find apples 50% better if you don't feed it, if you don't hand feed it everything. That is like, right? that is nuts. Um, so even these AIs are demonstrating a need for belief without actually formally coming to that conclusion. There, there is a benefit of belief in, by negativa, unfortunately. It's not this reproducible thing in the scientific realm, but this is belief via negativa that's being demonstrated in knockout training. And we see the same thing in the super forecaster research. So uh, belief is the last great unexplored part of philosophy of mind. And by default, scientific methodology has no interest in it whatsoever. And that's, I, I think that's a fascinating part, and I think that's the old, that's a big downfall of the, of the blue church. Okay, uh, do do do. Julian, would you like to read your question? Just unmute yourself. I unmuted you, Julian. Uh, oh, is this working? Yep. Oh, okay. My question was. Um, Going from, I wrote it down. Where is it? Uh, is going from defined truths to a? Is there a good process from going from a defined truth to coming up with a process for the green box, whatever that yep. was? Yep. Like, if you could walk through that a bit. Yeah, uh, basic investigative skills help. Uh, it, if there's like, it, just to get started, uh, because we're all trained in the in the material scientist space already so you might as well use that training to your advantage uh there's some there's some in, like how to be a private eye for example that's you should do that on the weekend if you can if you can learn how to do it it's, it's just good to figure out the basic skills of deduction um but more pragmatically it's about finding what's missing that tends to be where I, i'm going to give anecdotal here uh it tends to be where i start uh i see what's there and then i say now what's missing from this and how do you figure out what's missing okay well uh give an example right so if i was to walk in if say an alien ship landed right an alien ship just landed right in my backyard and i have no the technology out of this world right like i can't figure this stuff out there's alien blips all over the place so somehow i get in this ship because there's a hole in the side and i walk in and i see dead aliens and i'm looking around i'm like okay how do i make sense of this right okay one for starters um they crashed all right so what's missing what's missing is why did they crash why did they not account for gravity? Did they not account for um, any type of electromagnetism we have been emitting? What, let's look at uh, any type of damages that they're experiencing. What's the color of the blood? Uh, what's, what's the, are they wearing clothes for starters? Do, does their civilization have clothes? Um, let's look at how their ergonomics are arranged on their, on their control panels. Do they have finger, are they finger or digit oriented? Are they psychically connected, right? So you start looking at all of, um, this is obviously a, a ridiculous example, but it's, it's, a, it's a pragmatic one because I'm throwing you into a space where there's no way you can actually know anything about this scenario. So you try to find what's missing instead, right? You try to do a differential analysis between what do I use when I was flying this ship versus what are they using when they fly this ship? And from the differential analysis, you can then get what's missing. And from that missing, you actually derive these, uh, these green boxes. Cool. Um, Dan, you had a question for Pat? 
Uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me find it. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question. You, you seem to, this whole blue church thing, you seem to be discounting. It's like science is this and not science is that. And, and, and so my question is, are not emergent complexity and chaos theory a part of science? Your criticism of science appears to discount these sciences. I'm not familiar with, as I said, with blue church lingo. I was trained in electrical engineering with a focus in signals and systems. Can you explain why you are eliminating network theory, emergent complexity, and chaos theory from your explanations and criticisms? Yes, that's a fantastic question. Um, it's 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 an interest. It's it's interesting for multiple layers that question because it's it on one hand it's stating we're finally ready to tackle the complexity that we didn't have before, um, and that's true. We do have that, but it's also not true, uh, and here's why. So so a lot of science is trying to find this axiomatic truth and then extrapolate and build upon it. This is kind of the tradition that we've been doing for a long time. Well, what is, what is electron valence? What is a transistor? What is a, what is a chip? And then you, you extrapolate and you keep going and going, getting that fine level precision control over each step of the process so you can then extrapolate to the next layer of emergence. Um, and as a result, you, you naturally explode into that high level of complexity, especially when you have a, a billion circuits all over the world firing asynchronously at one another. So the, the only reason complexity science even exists is because we've made the internet. Um, we've always been in complexity. Complexity has been with us since the very beginning. We just have been approaching it with the wrong tools. We didn't actually look at the complexity as a standalone concept and say, hey, we should probably address that as is. We just kind of fumbled along and with, with these kind of like proxies to manage complexity, which we've been calling science this entire time. So I would, I would say that the complexity um, as an abstract concept, um, even that is still a technically a model. It's a good model for the domain of problems it's resolving for sure. Um, but the complexity that you think you're addressing, it's still beyond even that. So I, I, I think complexity science is kind of a premature phrase. I think network um, graph theory, uh, network categorization, topography analysis, I think that's more accurate. Um, but complexity is always going to be one step beyond whatever categories you put around it just by by the definition of the, of the phrase. And that might be semantic argument, I agree. Um, but um, our traditional approach to handle complexity is to like piece it off and we're still doing that to this day. Uh, but meanwhile, our brain resolves complexity in a fundamentally different way than our scientific approaches. And belief is a big part of that. If I may just follow up here, mm -hmm. it, it's just, it, it, it seems to me that your, your definition of science seems to be very Cartesian Mm -hmm. it, 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 it requires, it requires certainty. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of science, it doesn't require, we, we don't need that, that, uh, uh, that level of self doubt that, that, that Descartes had, that, that it's that probability fits within science. We don't have to be a hundred percent certain of things, but science can guide us in reasonable directions. That's right. And that's, that's a problem of induction. That's been known since the Scottish Enlightenment, where um, it doesn't, you know, the traditional example is I've seen red apples and I've seen a hundred apples and they're all red. And you can't state that the next apple you're going to see is green, right? Um, or or uh, that is an ongoing problem with induction. But for science, pragmatically speaking, eh, it's good enough. You get along with it, right? You don't need that high level of precision every step of the way. As you said, that's very true. And by science, I, I actually mean the scientific method, the, the means in which we're going through and trying to resolve the complexity into pragmatic examples. And you don't need the high level of, of tremendous control over each step of that. That is true. Um, but that's, it, it has a monopoly on our problem resolving space. It's not the only way to resolve problems. And AI, the black box of AI that's coming up, and I don't mean like Kurzweilian stuff. I mean, even tr like self-driving cars, how do, you know, how do they work when the snow hits the road? Like, for example, they don't talk about that. Traditionally, when you have a uh, self-driving car, it has six sensors. You're dealing with um, LIDAR and optics and I think a couple other ones. Um, and that's good when you're in California where it's not raining, there's no weather conditions, it's perfect road all the time. You go to Minnesota or somewhere that's snowing, hit a fresh plow of snow, car is driving. What do you do now? Well, the car now ships over to 26 totally different sensors. And one of those sensors is pinging Google Maps to then find, oh, 
are there landmarks I can orient myself to? And then from that orientation, where is the curve in the road so I can actually stay in the road even though I can't actually see it? Now, admittedly, there's some improvements recently in LIDAR that can penetrate the snow and tell the difference between the snow and the road, yes. But before that, it was then kicking off to an explosion of sensory methodologies to then come up with that probabilistic good enough solution to then figure out where the road is. Now, the reason why that's important is because that's actually not how our brain works. Data science is trapped in this weird death spiral where it needs more and more information to resolve infinitely minute problems. It needs, it needs bigger data sets and it needs more training and it needs more human beings to solve these more complicated problems and get that extra level of precision that's needed for either an insurance settlement or, or any type of high level, uh, maybe even a, a astrophysical research. But that's not how our brains actually work. Our brains don't just go through mitosis and grow more neurons whenever it comes across a complicated problem. We'd run ourselves out of resources if we did something so silly. What, we, what the brain is actually doing instead, the brain is taking the limited resources it has and it's doing its best it can with it. It's dealing in concepts of compression. It's taking, um, it's, it's um, well, long story short, the brain is solving these problems one way, science is solving them in a totally fundamentally different way. And as a result, you're getting two different resource consumption strategies that are not playing well with each other right now. And, th and that's why I'm kind of um, a heavy critic of the scientific methodology at this time, because AI is showing that there is another way and it's making it more and more apparent as time goes on. Okay, um, we'll do uh, one more question. Um, Solomon. Uh, you had a question, or you had a few questions. If you can unmute yourself. Or I will unmute you. You're unmuted, Solomon. Okay, um, let me see the, uh, what did I ask? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, what would be an alternative onto epistemology to transcend and transcribe into another order of reality? Now, I was thinking about the living consciousness uh, classroom and the work of Christopher Bache and David Bohm, his implicit order, that kind of stuff. And then just something that I've been thinking the last weeks or months, um, the whole idea that we only know about 4% of the knowable or what we think of the knowable and then this dark matter and all the other stuff. So how about the notion of law and regularity and constants when or if each moment is a singular event with its own unique phenomenology? And the question of flow as a point of view I would, um, that is, that's a fun little spot that I've seen uh, come into play when we started realizing the limits of scientific methodology, probably around when the postmodernists took a crack at it. Um, admittedly, they were sloppy by my standards, um, but they were coming up with what you're talking about as a kind of thought experiment um, to sort of tease at and reveal some of the limitations of of what we were doing with our scientific utopia um so just to give you an example of a transcendence of reality it's going to be a boring example uh, but i'll give you one when the nsa was starting around in the 60s to integrate or 50s and 60s to integrate computers for their signal analysis um, they intrinsically went to, um, and I don't, I'm, not throwing, I'm not throwing shade at electric engineers here. I'm just reciting um, uh, history. Um, but they went to electric engineers, scientists, um, hard science professors, physicists, chemists, to write the first programs. Um, and they were using a very primitive language. I think it was binary and maybe assembly and something else, but um, I, might, I might be recalling that incorrectly. Uh, but they were going to these very, very smart and very talented people who understood every constraint and every rule and every problem that could possibly exist in any permutation of multiple domains. They went to these people and they said, write these programs to help us in the signal analysis because the signals are doing weird things. Um, what, 
what does it mean when when the Russians are sending this signal and it's bouncing in this weird way? I mean, that's that's outside of of what we know to be the case. So how do we decipher that? Or worse, um, the, these pattern of signals is coming through in a manner that is defying us because is this encrypted? Wait, what's encryption? Wait, is that a thing? Oh man, wait, they're they're obfuscating with their messages now, right? Um, so when they went to these uh, scientists, their reality. Uh, their way of transcending reality was, was materialism and material scientism. Um, well, not scientism, but hard, actual scientific methodology, you know, go through the rigor and do it damn right. Um, uh, they went to that. And so when they were trying to write their code, originally, it just didn't work. Absolutely did not work. Um, they were trying to account for too much. Uh, they didn't understand that they were being outplayed by other humans. Uh, some of the Russians were sending signals that were easy to crack. And when you cracked them, you got the answer, but it wasn't the answer you were looking for because there was a secondary encryption in it. So there was all of these things that humans trying to outsmart each other. And uh, from my experience, uh, scientists make terrible spies, uh, from, from, at least from what I've seen. Um, so what the, what the NSA did instead is that they started hiring a bunch of musicians and philosophers and, ling and language majors. And they were writing the programs and they were performing infinitely better infinitely better in terms of uh, getting the code to work instead of trying to get that pure scientific uh, that scientific purism in the code to comply with the limitations of the machine these guys were willing to abuse those constraints just to solve the problem um, and that that is one of those transcendence points that had profound ramifications on the rest of our lives uh, this is where you get your stallmans and is where you got your linus torvald and all of these these so-called visionaries um, to then look at computers in a totally different transcendent matter. Um, so uh, th everything has its place. I'm not trying, I, I know I've been lashing out at science a lot here and I, I don't mean to turn it into a soapbox. It is a tool. Science is a tool, but it's not the only tool. If there's anything to take away, that would be it. It's not the only tool. Hmm. So, um, Maybe we'll just sneak in one more question, if that's okay with you, Pat. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mimetic Caper, if you can uh, unmute yourself and read your question, and this will be the last one. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Pat. Uh, could science be described as a search heuristic to find other powerful heuristics that model experience? Heuristic. Like the idea, I guess, is the sort of that science is a tool that allows you to find other powerful heuristic tools. Like you could, you could say that, uh, you know, Newtonian physics, that's a powerful tool to model reality, right? And it was discovered through scientific methodology. Traditionally speaking, now I, I'm trying to, to answer that question. Um, I think it's rather apparent where my bias lies. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to envision our current technologically saturated world as if science didn't exist, right? And, and I'm going to this place so I can answer your question. So let's assume uh, my daughter's 21, for example. Uh, one day she's gonna have a daughter. I can tell you that when my grandparents are around, cars were the high tech, um, cars and planes are the high-tech experience for that generation. So you have a lot of mechanics in that era. Um, then a generation after that, computers were getting started. So you had a lot of really solid engineers of electric engineers in like the, the 60s and 80s, rock stars for sure. And then with the software phase, now my generation, we come in and we understand the software really well. My daughter's generation does not know a damn thing about any of those three technological platforms. She knows how to swipe her finger on a phone, um, and she knows how to use that phone to get the maximum amount of social attention, right? So, so those are the problem domains that she's been exposed to. And her grandchild, after, or her child after that, I don't even think they'll know computers even exist, given the rate we're going. So, when when I say when you say heuristic, the ability to um, kind of make sense. Of reality, if I if I'm interpreting you correctly, the, the the kind of the rule of thumb that states, okay, we're going to take the tools we have, the problems we have, and we're going to solve it. Yeah, that, that's effectively what we've been doing, uh, well before 
you know, even atomic theory well before anything. That's, that's what we've been doing. I think it's important to step back and realize, uh, ask yourself a question, am I framing this to be scientifically compliant? Am I trying to explore this in a way that's being scientifically compliant? And if the answer is yes, great. There's nothing wrong with that. It has to be done. You, you can't just throw that tool out entirely. You still need to use it. Um, so what you want to say in addition to that, you want to say, now, let's assume I wasn't trained in science. Let's assume I wasn't trained in any of this stuff. I don't know anything. So effectively, everything is a, a crazy phenomenon, and I have no explanation of it, right? Um, that's our original base point for heuristics. It's, it's not as if I'm trying to frame the heuristic to then hopefully find investment money <laughs> for my new app or my new process or my new discovery on, on quantum physics. Um, that's a nice little bolt on we've been doing uh, since probably the British. Um, but before that, we've been trying to solve these complicated problems in the, in the, in the ways we've had, even, even without that scientific either crutch or that scientific focus or that scientific discipline or rigor. Um, and it is a messier process. It's a, it's a, it's a much messier process. Now, does that, when you sum all that together, does that result in the scientific method? I don't think so. I think the scientific method is unique. Um, I think it's a unique discovery. Uh, I don't think if given infinite monkeys, uh, in a room, you can heuristically come up with the scientific method. I think that is, I think the scientific method is a result of tremendous abuse from a, the Holy Roman emperorship and the, and the papal church. I think almost all of scientific methodology is a reaction against that tremendously tremendous shit show of, of European history. Um, and there's a reason that you have a lot of the core thinkers, the, the primary huge scientific factors uh, and, and major players of that time, they were all anti-papal. They saw what the Thirty Year War was. It was their Holocaust before the Holocaust. It, they were. It wasn't a war with like soldiers marching in like like squares and politely shooting each other. It was dragging your neighbors out of their house and nailing their kids to a tree. I mean, it was horrible. Um, and when you go through that for thirty years, if you identify the source of that, you're going to hate that source for the rest of your life and the rest of your and your grandchildren's lives. Uh, you're going to pass that tradition on to say, please don't do that again. Like literally, that was the never again. That was like the first never again moment for Europe. Most of American history comes from like the, the founding fathers, founding fathers lived through that war. So it's it, to, to say that scientific methodology is like this heuristic or this sum of heuristics, you have to take it in the time in which it was formed. It was a form of rebellion too. It was a way to rebel against, you know, papal authority and that's baked into the tradition as well. Science doesn't stand alone of the human experience. It is the scientific methodology is born of the human experience, not just like heuristics. It's, it's born of the political pressures of its time as well. So I think that's, that's an important thing to factor in to, to hopefully answer your question. Yeah, okay. I know that, that basically answers. I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to establish is that there is sort of a continuum between science and uh, what, what it is you're talking about with uh, looking at belief and um, or, I don't know, let's call it post-science, um, whatever it is. Uh, post I, I don't, I don't know if there's anything post-science. I think science well, is science. I, I mean, um, cause you, you described the, the scientific process as you started with a belief, a hypothesis, and then you go, towards uh defined truth and then ah, you, I see, you I get see. that axiom right right right, um, right and you're saying that that is a limited uh it's premature is what i'm saying okay. um what i'm both but what what this entire uh talk has been about is mostly saying okay before we even get to the hypothesis stage before we even get there we should probably do this due diligence first we should incorporate elements of philosophy of mind. We should bring in epistemology. We should, we should bolt that on to the pre-scientific methodology phase. That's effectively what I'm advocating for um, because it's, it, it's too quick to jump in and say it, whether the, the weirdness of the peer review system, um, the political indulgences that exist in academia, um, these are just, these aren't causes. These are just culprits of, of when you abuse 
the, the empire of science, which has been abused since the end of World War II with the advent of nuclear weapons. And once, well, that's not actually true. It, it goes back to the British. I mean, they, they horribly abused their, their entropic, their study of entropy and, and came up with all kinds of weapons of war that were devastating. Um, but the, uh, I, I think what you want to do is kind of, instead of going rushing to the scientific method, I'm recommending a triage phase, basically. Saying, okay, hold on, back up. Let's before we get the hypothesis, let's let's kind of really examine our, our premises here with a, with a different look. And instead of tossing belief out the window, let's bring it in. You can discount it when you get that hypothesis because you have to because there's too much economic pressures. You can't just you can't just like nakedly bake your belief into into a hypothesis and just kind of run with that torch forever. You have to do some due diligence in advance. But what I'm what I'm basically saying is pre hypothesis. Let's you know, let's define our terms and let's be adults and bring belief to the table as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I basically agree. I mean, the so uh, the uh, I'm going to just jump in because um, we're going to have to close up right now. Okay. Um, so, uh, Pat, um, before I make some closing announcements, do you have any uh, kind of a closing thoughts for us? Oh uh, no, I think I've spoken enough. Um, I. Uh, Thank you again for all these questions. I'm not actually used to a group Q and A. It's the first time I'm used to shit posting and then hiding behind a Tor uh, proxy, but whatever. <laughs> uh, so this is a, this has been good. Uh, thank you again for listening and sticking around and kind of uh, working with me, forcing me to reconcile my <laughs> epistem epistemological reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I do appreciate. It. Thank you, gentlemen and, and ladies. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so uh, in a moment, I'll make some announcements about upcoming events. But first, Pat, thanks so much for coming on. It was greatly appreciated. Of course. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the next two events that are happening tomorrow. Uh, and you can go to the, the website, the, the stoa.ca, which I'll put in the, the chat box. Um, so 11 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, situational assessment with Jordan Hall, who was the guy, again, who, who coined the, the Blue Church. He'll be coming in and doing a Q&A similar to this format, uh, nine, uh, 60 minutes. And then at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, we have uh, my friend Daniel, who is the co-founder of Solstice in Toronto. He's going to do a metamind, mastermind, metagame mastermind uh, prototyping session. I think, Daniel, you're, you're in the, the chat. If, um, if you want to unmute yourself and maybe just give a... a a little mention on what we're gonna what we can expect for that yeah so this is going to be an exploration on how accountability groups can help people maintain their sanity their sovereignty and actually figure out how to respond to the covid pandemic cool cool yeah so i'm definitely looking forward to that Oops. yeah I just unmuted myself and then I, I turn off my video so yeah i'm, I'm looking for that um sign up for the, the mailing list and I'm viewing the STOA as a gift uh, in this time of need for all of us to freely use. If you're inspired to provide a, a gift to the STOA, just go to the website, thestoa.ca, and look at the gift economy uh, at the bottom of the page. All right, everyone. Thank you.